You know, maybe I'm crazy, but it seems to me that YouTube game dev is one of the harder places to exist as a creator. Being a solo dev means you're responsible for all the art, all the programming, all the ideas, and then you put it together, try to make it look as polished as possible, only to dramatically shift gears to the YouTube side, which means writing, voicing, and editing videos, the whole time just praying that your game is actually fun. And then, with the cherry on top being that Google AdSense puts you in the same category as COD players, who can grind out like 17 clips in a week, to me, it's no surprise that so many legends in this space sort of disappear. Alright, yeah, but you know, not me, right? I'm, I'm totally here to stay. Would life really even be worth living without these time crunch game development uh, mental breakdowns? Yes, yeah, it, it totally would, obviously. Okay, listen, alright guys, I can sense it. That's not gonna stop you from wanting to do a YouTube game dev. So instead, I'm here to reflect on my first year working on game dev. This is every project I made, the ups, the downs, the successes, and also the failures of 2023. Uh, look at that, I uh, have a Patreon. You guys probably know the deal by now, but it's $5 a month and it really helps support the channel. I also throw in all the art and all the coding of all the past game jams I've done. And mostly, I just want to thank you guys so much for the support. Something that I've been way more excited about that's totally free has been the Discord. Maybe it's because this YouTube community is just so full of creators, but some of the most fun I've had in the past couple weeks has just been jumping into a late night voice chat, listening to Niall's games talk about Donkey failing at his game jam submission, or listening to Keith Makes Games talk about just total wacky unreal drama while showing off his insanely polished platformer prototypes. So so yeah, feel free to join the Discord and bug me about stuff. Honestly, any distraction that's gonna pull me away from staring at my awful code, I'll take it. Alright, with that said, let's get into the video. Okay, my journey in learning how to code starts in the same place that a lot of other Godot users start, and that is a Heartbeast video. Yeah, okay, uh, we're Heartbeast simps here, I, I, I can admit it. He really does come up in like half of my videos, but there's a good reason for it. These tutorials were really integral to how I learned Godot. I know a lot of people will stress hammering down the basics and reading through documentation, but sometimes I think front-loading all the boring stuff when starting a new hobby can kind of sabotage yourself and set you up for failure. I find that even if my fundamentals are super wrong and I'm gonna have to relearn everything down the line, as long as I'm having fun, I'm way more likely to stick with it. And this is kind of true for every aspect of my life. Like in uh, in guitar, I learned how to sweet pick before I knew how to read music. No, no, that's a joke. I, as a guitar player, you never learn how to read music. But regardless, these Heartbeast videos were a huge jumping off point for me getting into Godot. For the first six months of 2023, it's just me scavenging the internet for tutorials and finding anything I can that's useful to work on this project labeled Billy the Cursed. It starts off really basic, just making a player that can move, a weapon that can shoot, and then an enemy that can be shot. Although, right away, you you can tell in this old footage that I'm already hyper obsessed with lighting. My poor friends and family at this time are just constantly bombarded by me oversharing progress. And I feel bad, it's definitely main character syndrome. So starting in February of 2023, I get in the habit of uploading shorts. And uh, yeah, they're, they're really bad. Here's the thing though, I actually recommend it. Sure, no one's gonna see them and you're probably not gonna be very good at it, but that's kind of the point. If you want to create content uh, like this dumb stuff, my advice is to find your voice, which by that I mean your style and the tone of your content. For me at least, doing short form content honed in on that way faster. It lets you not worry so much about editing or getting these long 10 minute videos. At the time, I was doing a short a week, and even though I knew that almost no one was watching, that arbitrary deadline of putting out something every week actually really kept me focused. During this time, I'm learning quite a bit, from state machines to custom classes, working on player health or spawning in waves of enemies, and this all kind of leads up to me finally adding a shop to the game. Which, for only being 3 or 4 months in, I, I was extremely happy to get working. In the background of all this, month after month, a friend keeps pressuring me to look into game jams. And as you could have guessed, that's unfortunately where everything goes a little off the rails. Alright, so in July of 2023, my first game jam ever is Grim Ticket. Until now, I was convinced game jams were just a waste of time. The idea of throwing away code just seems so dumb. But as the Billy the Curse project gets bigger, I definitely get that calling to start something new. The theme of the jam is train, uh, the game takes place on a train, I nailed it. It was a stealth game with the sole purpose to avoid getting caught by these skeletons. And there's actually a lot here that I'm doing right, especially for my first game jam. I managed to keep the scope relatively small, and the gameplay gets established really early. Yeah, I remember having things that I wanted to add that I never get to, but compared to some other jams down the line, this this one really wasn't too bad. And I think, most importantly, the gameplay is actually fun. The game scores 11th out of 82 entries, with the biggest notable con being that there is no audio. That is a category that I personally hate now after doing all these game jams. Alright, next up was Scrap Heap Summit, and this is one of my least favorite games I, I ever worked on. I think the theme was Malfunction, and the whole premise of the game was you get into an elevator and you have to fix these machines. The thing is, it was a systems heavy game. In order for you to experience the full gameplay loop, all the systems actually have to be working. And the idea was supposed to be that every machine breaks down in different ways, and the game slowly spirals out into a bullet hell. The problem is that I overscoped everything in this game start to finish. Every machine was supposed to have its own unique attacks. The machines have health that breaks down into like four separate categories. It's really all way too much. Even the tools. I waste so much time making sure that like you can throw buckets and wrenches. And this is not an over exaggeration, but one of the first times I could finally play the game was hours before the deadline. That's a lot of negative. There were some good things, like letting the player fly around the map with the fire extinguisher. Okay, that's actually all I have for good things, but, but that was fun. I think there is a good game somewhere in here, but it just needs a lot of dumb stuff cut out. It scored eighth out of 46 entries, which I thought was pretty generous. The next game was one that sort of made the channel, along with all the dumb platformer memes, and that was Sunseeker. <laughs> 
game was Ascension, and the concept was really simple. It was an isometric platformer where the entire jump mechanic is just derived from this throwable bomb that was in Billy the Cursed. There really wasn't much new here in terms of things I was learning, the biggest one being the art style and the perspective were quite different. If I haven't mentioned it yet, these were all week-long game jams, and working on Sunseeker was how I thought most of these game jams were going to feel. I maybe spent the first two or three days working on mechanics and the rest of the week doing level design. When I think back on game jams that I actually had fun working on, this is what comes to mind. It was the reason why growing up making maps in time splitters, or more recently making levels in Mario Maker have always been so much fun. Sure, you don't get as much replayability as when you work on a systems-based game. Once you beat the level, it's done. There's no point in going back. But if I'm being honest, replayability is kind of overrated in this game jam world. We have a hundred other games to play. In my experience, people are just happy to get that game complete screen. So Sunseeker was fun to work on. It was pretty fun to play. The art style definitely does a lot of the heavy lifting, making it stand out in a game jam, but it still had its flaws. I tend to make games pretty challenging, and Sunseeker is no exception. That, and there's one negative trait that's been carrying over from each game jam until now. That is that they're all uh, uh, fucking floaty. There, okay, I admit it. All the comments were right. I was probably just too stubborn to see it at the time, but yeah, all these games feel like you're running on ice. And when you make a platformer, it, it kind of stands out. With all that said, though, I'm still really happy with Sunseeker. To this day, it's still my most requested game to go back and do a full release for. I ended up getting second place out of 55 entries, which was super encouraging. It really meant a lot to me. Fresh off of Sunseeker, I see that Ludum Dare is doing their game jam. I foolishly jump in, thinking it's only 48 hours. How bad could that be? And I'll just say, there's a reason why I haven't done any other 48 hour game jams. It's a lot of work, and it's more than just losing a weekend, it's also losing a lot of sleep. The theme was limited space, and I feel like I came up with a pretty solid mechanic, albeit uh, totally airlifted from Binding of Isaac. The mechanic itself eliminated jumping, which totally played with my expectation of what it means to be a platformer. In the game, you played as a ghost who could fly, but you were chained to the last body you were in. I think the idea of making a puzzle platformer, where you're really limited to the body that you're in, could be super interesting, although I'm now realizing uh, that's just Mario Odyssey. But the good news is, uh, I never actually got that far, and instead of puzzles, it's just a more traditional platformer. So, in terms of pros, I think the idea was really strong, and there's definitely more I could do, especially with more than 48 hours. For the cons, this one kills me, so I said before, every game was floaty up until now. And for some crazy reason, maybe because I wasn't sleeping, or maybe just because I'm not a smart person, I make the main character even slippier. I think the thought process was you play as a ghost, but it wasn't just him, it was also the robot you embody, and this ends up standing out so much that nearly all the comments I get are about this. It's something I definitely would have caught if I had more time to reflect, but the 48 hour jams are way more shoot from the hip. And if I'm being honest, that's probably why I haven't done any sense. The game scored 31st overall out of 480 89 submissions, which is way better than I thought it would, so I'll take it. After this, I was back to the week-long game jams with Hollow's Night. This was a Halloween-themed platformer, and it was sort of my love letter to the genre, realizing that I never did a true side-scroller game. Or at least, you know, that was my justification at the time. You guys bought it. And for me, this is the kind of game I really like working on. Similar to Sunseeker, I spend the first weekend just nailing the mechanics. Jumping, wall sliding, dying, and the basic stuff. I think in game jams, the faster I get to the gameplay loop, the easier it actually is for me to believe in the idea. And with this game being a really straightforward platformer, I got to spend the most of my time on level design. I would say this is probably the safest of the projects I work on. While I've never done a side-scroller before, this is kind of Godot 101. Uh, regardless though, I think the game is fun. Uh, it's way too hard, like always. The biggest downfall being that the theme was Harvest, and I, I had you play as a pumpkin that was harvested. Are you buying that? Yeah, well, uh, neither did anyone else, because I scored super low on that. The game scores 12 overall out of 104 entries, but it gets like 58th in theme, which does the best job in summing up this game jam. It was fun, and it was really pretty, but it wasn't really original. And I think for game jams, people care a lot more about playing something that they've never seen before. At this point, doing game jams, I can definitely feel the fatigue. So for the next game jam, I try something a little different. You know, making games can be a lot harder than it seems, but luckily, there's help out there, like a sponsor of today's video, Brilliant.org. Brilliant has thousands of courses that range from fundamental math and science to neural networks and helping better understand AI. I always say that one of the problems that I face when trying to learn new things is that if I'm not actively participating, it's hard for me to absorb the information. But luckily, that's where Brilliant really shines. Every course being interactive and highly visual it makes it way more engaging and fun to me. While working in Godot, people have always told me that GDScript is very similar to Python. So when I saw Brilliant had a course programming with Python, I knew I had to jump into that. That. And immediately it's become my favorite brilliant course. It sort of feels like working with Godot's older brother the whole time feeling like I'm sharpening my fundamentals. If you want to jump in and try any of this yourself, there's actually a 30 day free trial when you visit brilliant.org forward slash MZ. And the first 200 users that sign up get 20% off the annual plan. And I just want to thank Brilliant so much for supporting the channel. All right, now back to the video. Uh, listen, these game jams start to take a lot out of you. So in an attempt to spice it up, I reach out to two friends uh, to do it for me. No, obviously I'm just kidding. But for the next game jam, I do try teaming up. And it kind of opened my eyes. Teams are much trickier 
easier than you think. We make a boss rush rhythm game called Cat Jam. I think in a game jam, if you're working alone, the time frame sort of cures any decision paralysis. But unfortunately, the opposite is totally true when you're with a team. The stress of debating back and forth with teammates, it can be pretty tough. There are definitely things that I wanted in the game that didn't make it, which I think could have helped. But the flip side is there's things that I would have never done that came out pretty well. With one of those being using music as a mechanic at all, I just would have never gone into this direction. But it is nice to have a team to push you into uncharted territory. For pros, I think the concept is really interesting and unique. You take out your base, which is a weapon, and as you play notes on time, it creates bullets. And the game is just boss fights, you're running and dodging. But unfortunately, and this is probably really common when you try new ideas, I don't think that it's actually fun. It's something about your brain focusing on this stream of notes coming down, and the inability for the player to move while attacking. Which, if I recall correctly, I think that was my decision. Sometimes in team games, you'll talk someone into your idea, and then you'll realize that your idea was bad, but they do all the effort to get it working, so now you kind of can't say anything. Uh, this might have been one of those times. The game scores 18th out of 140 entries, which, now that I look back on it, is way better than I remember. And notably, it does score third in originality, compared to, like, the pumpkin game, which I, I think got, like, 45th or something. And this leads us to the last game jam of the year. Uh, the last game I made in 2023. And there was sort of a lot going on here. The game itself is almost a combination of everything I've learned in 2023. For starters, it makes use of all the lighting techniques I learned early on in the year. The gameplay is like a mixture of puzzle, platform, and action. I bring back a lot of old techniques like the checkpoint or camera system from old game jams. It's rewritten from scratch, but this time I have a way better idea of how to manage it. I'm back to doing level design and having a bigger art focus. And probably the most important, uh, the gameplay works. It's maybe not the most fun game I've made, but it's, it's good. I end up winning the game jam, getting first out of 117, but I can't help but feel a little bittersweet about it. In the background of all this, uh, me and my girlfriend of 10 years were actually going through a breakup. Man, that is such a hard line to record. And I guess it's kind of reflective to some of the messages in that game. They're kind of just the collection of thoughts I had while everything was happening. I debated going back and forth on whether or not to really include any of this, but ultimately, video games are art, and in any other art form, I probably wouldn't think twice about it. That, and it sort of seems undeniable to me that there's a connection between all this and my journey trying to learn game development. That, as I'm learning all these new things, I might be sort of changing as a person. Oh god, I, I can already hear the, the brain dead YouTube comments now saying like, you broke up because of game dev. It's not what I'm saying. Instead, just that there are paths in life, and as you take them, small things sort of spiral out, and you drift further apart. And it is sad. There definitely is a real conversation there about how game dev can encompass your whole life. Back when I was growing up, there used to be a lot more talks about game development crunching, but as an outsider, I remember the narrative being about how the company was forcing employees to stay. Now I truly wonder whether that's the case, or if instead, when you work on something, you love it and you believe in it, you're way more compelled to sacrifice parts of your life to see it come together. This sounds so somber and negative, but this really was a good year. I couldn't be more happy or proud of the progress I made. If anything, it's just that change makes me sad, and I get nostalgic for, you know, how things used to be. Well, it's hard to wrap a video like this up, but thanks for watching. I know it took a pretty weird turn, but I did want to be honest about the real journey. Until next time, guys, I'll see you later. Oh, and come bug me on Discord now that I'm fucking forever alone.